Hi, and welcome to the Agile Lean Gardener. I'm Steve from Smart Agile for all your Agile Lean and Flow needs. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to start using Lean and Flow metrics in Scrum so you can start getting more things done faster, provide leadership with accurate, reliable due dates, reduce stress and fatigue, and increase well being. It sounds a bold claim, just like Jeff Sutherland's first book, doesn't it? Yep, but Lean and Flow metrics actually work. So let's get into it. First, let's remember that lean thinking is part of Scrum. Story points and velocity are not, and neither are estimates. Just check the Scrum guide. It's all there or not, as the case may be. Also, there's an argument to say that Scrum isn't even agile. Check this video out for more detail on that. But the point is that a lot of what we think Scrum is actually isn't. So there is no reason why we can't use lean and flow metrics in the Scrum framework without breaking any of the rules. So let's get started. I've broken this into chapters, which you can find in the description below, so you can skip to the relevant parts easily. But I'd highly recommend you don't skip the cycle time chapter because in many ways it is the most important. And this is what I'm going to cover today. OK, first up is how to start by understanding your cycle time. Calculate your throughput to allow you to forecast. Limit work in progress to deliver faster. Reduce context switching to increase speed and quality and reduce stress and fatigue. Calculate your flow efficiency to identify cues and handoffs. Understand your work item age to keep you on track against your forecasts. And finally, how to use lean flow metrics in your scrum ceremonies. Now, I won't be going into deep detail. I've got separate videos on all of these that you can watch later. And the links to them are in the description below. And the main thing I'm trying to do here is to let you know how to start. Build awareness of what lean flow metrics are, what they can do for you, and how to use them in scrum. Okay, so the first thing you need to start doing is capturing your cycle time. It's pretty much the bedrock on which everything else is based and it's the key starting point. A cycle time is simply the time it takes from any two points in your workflow. In this example here, cycle time starts from the in progress column and finishes at done. So you need to decide which two workflow states you want to monitor for your cycle time and ensure all team members update their work items on the board once a day. You don't want to go crazy with board updates. Once a day is good enough. Now you'll notice we have a to-do column here, which we use on our sprint board. Now, just because we've taken something into sprint doesn't mean our cycle time has started. It only starts when we actually pick up a work item and actually start work on it. The to-do column is a queue, which should be ordered in priority and we pick from it when we have capacity. And the Agile tool you're using, whether it's Jira or Azure DevOps or whatever else it is, is tracking the time it takes a work item to get from state to state in the background. You just need to extract that data. Now it's easy in some tools like Jira with the help of plugins. And I've got a video on that in the description below. Other tools require an API call and others provide this data natively like Kanbanize. Now, once you extract this data, you can put it into something like Excel and it might look something like this. You simply subtract the start date from the end date. In our case, the date it entered in progress to the date it entered done and add one day. And this is because we want to capture even parts of a day. If your cycle time for a work item started on the 1st of August and also ended on the 1st of August, if you didn't add that one day, your cycle time would be zero, which isn't any help at all. Now, this shows you all the individual cycle times for all our work items. The date our work item hits in progress must be the first time it entered that state, and the date our item entered done must be the last time it entered that state. And this is because work items often go up and down the workflow, and this way the real cycle time is captured. Now, we could take an average of all this, but we don't want to use an average. Plans based on assumptions about average conditions usually go wrong. This flaw shows up everywhere in business, distorting accounts, undermining forecasts, and dooming apparently well-considered projects. So if not an average, then what? Well, look, we want a high probability that our work item will finish. So let's use 85%, which is the 85th percentile. You can choose which probability you want to use and maybe discuss and agree this with your leadership. It's often called an SLE, a service level expectation, but I've never really liked that term. I like using 85% because it provides a high level of probability with a little bit of flexibility. And we can use Excel's percentile function, add up all of our individual cycle times and take the 85th percentile. And in this example, we see that out of all of our completed work items, the 85th percentile time for a individual item is 10 days. It does not matter that our work items are of different sizes and complexity. So this is telling us that we have an 85% probability of completing any work item based on our sample set of work items in 10 days. Now, if we're doing two week sprints, meaning we have 10 working days per sprint, this is probably not a good number for us. So we need to take some action. 
we may need to reduce the overall size and complexity of our work items, or perhaps we need to take less into Sprint. Maybe we haven't refined the work items prior to taking them into Sprint, or perhaps we didn't identify some dependencies. Either way, we need to get the 85th percentile cycle time for our individual work item down. Down to what? Well, that is up to you, but I like to get it down to about five days or lower. And once you've achieved this, then you need to only right size your work items going forward. And right sizing simply means making sure you don't take any work items into Sprint that seem bigger or more complex than you've seen before. This doesn't mean you don't need to do refinement. You still need to do that. Make sure the team understands the work item, have broken it down appropriately, have identified any dependencies and agreed that it seems right sized compared to the previous work items. It also doesn't mean trying to make work items the same size or complexity. You don't need to do that. And it's part of the beauty of using cycle time and percentiles. Right, the next thing you're gonna to need to do is look at your throughput. But before that, hit that subscribe button and give that like button a smash. And if you're in a generous mood, click the thanks button below, just as James Chan and Rommel Bandera did on my last video about ChatGPT and the Scrum Master Guide. Thanks James and Rommel B, it was most appreciated. Right, throughput. I mentioned earlier that estimates are not part of Scrum, but forecasting is. Now check the Scrum Guide, you'll find no mention of estimates, but you will for forecasts. A traditional estimate in Scrum is based on educated guesswork. A forecast is based on data. So we're going to use a data-driven approach using our throughput to help us forecast. Now throughput is simply the number of things done per unit of time. For example, if we got 10 work items done in our last two week sprint, then our throughput would be 10 work items in two weeks. Throughput allows us to use Monte Carlo simulation. A Monte Carlo simulation is a technique that allows us to forecast, which takes into account risk, uncertainty, and variability. Now, there's two uh, variations of Monte Carlo that can help us. I'm not going to go in deep detail here. I've got videos on both of these variations that show you exactly how to do it with a free Excel template found in the description below. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the benefit of using throughput with Monte Carlo. All right, the first variation is to tell us how many work items we can get done for a specified time, such as our sprint. We can also use the 85th percentile so that we'll have a high probability of this actually happening. And we use our historical throughput data, which you can see in column B. And we change the dates in column A to be the date we wish to start and enumerate from that date. We'll put our end date in cell F6 and then run the simulation. Now the output will look something like this. In column A, we see how many work items will be completed against a probability of it actually happening. All we need to do is go down to 85% and read off how many items would be completed against that probability. In this case, 54. So this is telling us that we will get 54 work items done with an 85% probability of it actually happening in our two week sprint. And this is great information to have for sprint planning. And the second variation, Monte Carlo, is to tell us when we'll get X number of work items completed, again, with our 85% probability of it happening. And we use our throughput data as before, but this time we tell the simulation how many items we're trying to get done. In this example, we're going to start on the 1st of August and we want to get 100 work items done. We run the simulation and see the output. As before, we run down the probability column to 85% and read off to the left the date by which we'll complete 100 work items, in this case, 29th of August. So this tells us that if we start on our 100 work items on the 1st of August, we will complete them 29 days later with an 85% chance of it happening. This is great information to have. You can use it to inform leadership how long it will take you to do various sized pieces of work. Just look back at previous work you've done for small, medium and large projects. Calculate how many work items each took and hey presto, you have the time it will take to do a small, medium and large project with an 85% probability of it happening. And you can also use this to forecast when your current backlog will complete. It leads to better conversations with product owners and stakeholders and helps to keep the size of the backlog smaller as they'll be more careful about just adding to the backlog as they can see the forecasted date to complete. Now, what you will almost certainly discover when you calculate your cycle time and Monte Carlo forecast is that they aren't good enough. But even if they are, there are things you need to do to actively manage the process to ensure you keep to your forecast. And the first is limiting your work in progress. And this is simply reducing the number of items that are in progress at any one time. We can do this by choosing to put a limit on our in progress column. The number you choose to limit your work in progress is dependent on the size and makeup of your team. To start, choose the number based on how many developers you have. So if you've got three devs, then put a width limit of three and run this for a few weeks, and then see the result and inspect and adapt. So the question that often gets asked is what would happen if we have a team member sat around not doing anything because it would break our WIP limit? 
or that team member should help the other team members complete their work before another item is picked up. This increases collaboration, communication and knowledge. And the point here is to finish what you're doing as a team before starting something new. Stop starting, start finishing. By limiting your whip, you will get more done faster. Now for more detail on this and what it looks like visually, click the link above or look in the description below. And the next thing you're going to need to do is reduce your context switching. The context switching is just task switching or multitasking. And you can call it whatever you like, but it's where you're trying to do multiple things at the same time and jumping between all of them. It is a silent killer and costs you a huge tax in throughput, quality and well-being. So ideally, we want to stop this completely or at least reduce it significantly. Context switching is real. In software development, it can be very high due to all the unknowns and uncertainty inherent in software development. And reducing context switching reduces stress and fatigue. It increases quality and speed. People are happier with less stress. Happier people work better. Fact. <laughs> For more detail on this and a fun test you can do at home to prove it's a very bad thing, click my video link in the description below. Now, when you find out what your cycle time is and forecast using Monte Carlo, you'll probably find that resulting data and forecast you see simply isn't good enough. So how do we fix this? The answer to that is flow efficiency. Now, if you agree that tracking cycle time to make forecasts for single and multiple work items is the way forward, which I definitely believe is true, then controlling the factors that affect cycle time should be a high priority for you. Now, these factors can be broken down into two basic parts, active time and inactive time. Active time is the time you actually spend working on things and inactive time is everything else. A flow efficiency equals active time divided by cycle time. So how do you get this data? Well, in your workflow, it's really important once you've actually started a work item to put it into blocked on hold workflow state whenever you're not actually working on it. And this is how you'll get your active time data. Here's a quick example, but for a more detailed look at flow efficiency, click the video link up there now or check the description below. So. If it took 21 days to complete a story, that is your cycle time, but the active time, the time you actually spent working on it was just one day, then that means 20 days were spent where essentially nothing was happening. 20 days of inactive time. Okay, that's an extreme example just to highlight the point. So where do you think you should focus your effort in this example? <laughs> exactly. You need to focus on getting that inactive time down. So if you aggressively go after that uh, inactive time in our example and manage to reduce it significantly while keeping your active time the same, that would mean that your 85th percentile would be five days instead of 20, much, much better, just by reducing the inactive time. Now, flow efficiency is a great way to start troubleshooting why your cycle times are too high and it helps you identify cues and handoffs. Next, you need to track the age of your work items. And for me, this is the most powerful metric of them all. Now, even when you've understood your cycle time and made a beautiful forecast using Monte Carlo, that doesn't mean it's it. You, you've got to put the work in and actively manage your process. And that's where work item age comes in. So what is an aging chart and why is it important? Well, think back to cycle time in Monte Carlo. The thing that they have in common is that they are looking at historical work, work that's finished. There's nothing you can do to improve their performance because they are done. You need to concentrate on your work in progress, your active work, and specifically how old it is. And you need to do this every day. I would strongly suggest you do this at the daily scrum. Right along the bottom, you can see your board column names. And at the side, you can see the number of days old the story is. And the story names are listed so you can read off to the left how old they are and they're placed in their current workflow state. You can mark your percentiles horizontally across the board. You can see that I've marked the 50th, 70th and 85th. This gives you pre-warning that you need to take action on a work item when you see them approaching these percentiles. Now, the power of this is understanding this at the time it's happening. It gives us great insight into actions we need to take on specific work items. This is a great chart to use at the Daily Scrum, and I find it makes it more meaningful as concentrating on the age of an item usually ends up in better discussions, resulting in actions leading to the right outcome. Now, for more detail and a free Excel template, check out the Aging Chart video on screen now or in the description below. So now, putting it all together, we can see where to use lean flow metrics in our Scrum ceremonies. As I've just mentioned, the Aging Whip Chart is great at the daily Scrum. It helps focus conversations on the right thing and keeps you on track. Our throughput is fantastic for sprint planning. It helps us understand how many things we can take into sprint and actually get done. Our Monte Carlo forecast is great at the sprint review. We can update our stakeholders on progress and discuss if we're still happy with whatever percentage we've agreed to. And at Sprint Retro, it's a great time to reflect on cycle time, flow efficiency, and as well as throughput. Are we in good shape or do we need to identify and fix handoffs or bottlenecks? 
Okay, I hope that gives you a great starting point. And remember, I have detailed videos on all of the topics covered in the description below. Okay, that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Stay humble and I will see you next time.